going to be so fun. Um, again, so everyone can see. I know a few folks have introduced themselves, but I think only Nikita and I can see it. <laughs> get started in whenever you're ready Nikita let's take it away all right let's do it I'm so nervous I don't know how politicians do this every day um, thank you everyone for taking time out of your Thursday evening to be here we were so overwhelmed with the amount of support and all the money we were able to raise for run for something you know uh, this whole thing kind of came out of myself Abe Ali and Rafi really wanted to help find more ways for people in Hollywood, including ourselves, to not only, you know, engage in social media posts, but also, you know, trying to support the organizations who are really out here, you know, changing the world every single day. Um, understanding the importance of local elections and supporting them felt like a really great place to start. And I think we're also infuriated by how certain crises are being handled in our communities these days. And we often forget that the process to fixing them isn't so black and white. And there are so many nuances about who has what power to do what within our community. And it really, the responsibility does fall on us on to educate ourselves on the names and the other positions that we're gonna be voting for in the fall. Um, because well, God knows that they, we desperately need a new generation of politicians that are not straight old white dudes. So with all that being said, I am so excited to throw it over to our moderator today, the amazing, lovely, can pull off bangs like no other, Amanda Littman, who is the co-founder and executive director for Run For Something. And she has so much insight on how elections work, especially on the ground level. Um, she was an email writer for Barack Obama's 2012 re-election campaign, all the way to being the email director for Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign. So. She's just incredible and thank you so much for helping us organize it and I'm gonna hand it off to her now. Thank you so much, Nikita. I am so excited about tonight, um, about so many people who joined and about our incredible host committee, um, Abe, Ali, Rafi, and Nikita herself who made this a success. Um, I wanna walk through a little bit of the agenda for this evening. Um, we're gonna keep this to an hour. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about Run For Something. I wanna do some level setting about Los Angeles politics and California California politics writ large. Really make sure we all understand the structures here. Uh, then I'll introduce uh, our candidates one by one. Um, they'll talk a little bit about themselves and their races, and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, I really encourage you, one, to participate in the chat to make sure to change your settings to all panelists and attendees. And two, if you have a question that jumps up uh, throughout the conversation, to use, if you look at the bottom of your screen, the little Q&A section, um, drop it in there, one, so we don't lose it, and two, when we open it up for Q&A, we'll pull from that list and, and more. Uh, I am really, really excited about this group. Um, almost everyone here tonight is from Los Angeles or from California real large. Um, this is going to be a really good conversation about why and how local government works and why it really matters. Um, to take a step back, for those of you who I don't know, which is most of you, my name is Amanda Littman. I am the co-founder and executive director of Run for Something. Run for Something recruits and supports young, diverse progressives running for local office. Uh, we have been around since the uh, inauguration day, 2017. Uh, I worked for Hillary, as Nikita mentioned, worked as her email director, uh, managing online fundraising and volunteer recruitment. After the campaign, I got a Facebook message from someone I went to college with. Hey Amanda, looks like you work in politics. I wanna run for office because if Trump can do this, anybody can, what do I do? And at the time, I did not have an answer for him because there was nowhere you could go if you were young, newly excited about politics and wanted to do more than vote and more than volunteer. If you wanted to actually lead, there was nowhere you could go that would help you. So I reached out to a whole bunch of people. One of them became my co-founder, Ross Morales Riquetto. And we wrote a plan and we built a website. And on inauguration day, we launched this organization. We thought we would get 100 people in the first year. Instead, in the first week, 1,000 people have signed up with us. Uh, and as of today, we're up to more than 57,000 young people across the country who've raised their hands to say they want to run for office. So we have built an organization that does two big things in service of that goal. We recruit people who want to run. Uh, that can look like Facebook ads and press uh, and social media and working with our alumni to find people. 
uh, that includes things like National Run for Office Day, which is our new favorite holiday, the week after Election Day, where we get public figures and celebrities and politicians and our partner groups all to talk about running for office. Uh, we do things like speaking to groups of young people. In the before pandemic times, we did college events uh, and high school events. In the pandemic times, it's looked a lot like jumping in front of Zooms full of 50 or 100 young people, often women, mostly people of color, and saying, you all should run for office. Once people sign up with us, they join a conference call, uh, then they have a one-on-one -on -one with a volunteer. And in that one-on-one, -on -one, we're looking for a couple key things. Is this person progressive, whatever that means, wherever they live? Is this person willing to work hard? Do they know how miserable a campaign is gonna be? Is this person um, exciting and interesting? Do they solve a problem, uh, see a problem in their community that they wanna solve? And finally, does this person meet our criteria of demographics? Run for something only works with people under the age of 40, so 18 to 40, uh, running for local office. So things like school board, city council, library board, Community College Board of Trustees, American River Flood Control District, um, uh, library boards who worked with at least three coroner candidates, which I find wild, um, really trying to make sure that we are investing in candidates who are going to run and win for the offices that make the biggest difference in people's lives. Once people come through our pipeline, once they've had that conversation with a volunteer, we give them as much help as we possibly can. That comes through partnerships, so work with other organizations, basically every democratic organization you can imagine, from state parties to national organizations to local grassroots groups, trying to get our candidates the resources they need. We do some training ourselves, so every week this summer, for example, we're running what we call the armchair chat series. Uh, this has been a free conversation with an expert practitioner. The first week was with a communications expert from the Pete Buttigieg campaign. The second week was with a national fundraising expert. Uh, just yesterday, we did one with Jessica Bird, who runs the Movement for Black Lives Electoral Justice Project. Uh, next week is with someone who's an expert on digital communication. We're inviting all of our pipeline to this, as well as streaming them live on Facebook and in partnership with Now This. Again, trying to make information about running for office as accessible and as free as possible. Uh, we do community building, so connect our candidates to each other over Slack and Facebook groups and alumni advisors. So people who've run before will get connected to folks currently running. Um, as anyone who's ever run for office will tell you, it is deeply unfun. You don't do it because it's sexy or glamorous. You do it because you want to solve a problem because uh, it's neither sexy nor glamorous enough to be worth it. Um, so we want to make sure that people don't feel alone. And then we do endorsements. And endorsements are really where we focus our time and energy in terms of one-on-one -on -one communication. Every candidate we endorse has to fill out an application. They need to give us a plan, a win number, and how they're gonna get from A to Z. We don't care how much money you've raised, in part because using that as a heuristic is a way to often use to screen out working class people, women, and candidates of color. We don't care what polling says, if there's even polling in your race. What we do care about is that you are running a grassroots driven campaign focused on connecting to voters in a meaningful and authentic way. We wanna know that you are running a vision driven campaign, not just a negative one against an incumbent or against your Republican opponent, but really one that is advocating for something for your community, not just against. We have endorsed more than 1300 people in our three and a half years. Of the about 950 or so who've gone through elections so far, 310 have won. Those winners are 55% women, about 48% people of color, 20% LGBTQ. They are incredible. They are the reason that more than 400,000 Virginians have access to health care through the expansion of Medicaid. They're people like Lena Hidalgo, who's the judge in Harris County. She's the county executive in Texas, who is basically the only sane elected official in Texas right now, making sure that she's trying to undo at least some of the damage that the governor and the state legislature have done during this uh, coronavirus pandemic. There are people like um, uh, Dave Hutchinson, a sheriff who on his first day in office worked to mitigate some of the damage that his office had been doing against trans inmates. They are amazing. They are going to be future presidents, future governors, future senators. And that's really exciting. But what's even more important is what they are doing right now to make life better for people. And I don't need to tell you any more of their stories because you're gonna meet three of our candidates tonight who are going to knock your socks off. Uh, before we get into that, I do wanna give a little bit of an introduction or a little level setting about how LA works and how California works um, so that you have a sense of how the candidates you're meeting tonight fit into this larger structure. Now, I should be candid here. I'm not a Californian. 
However, I spend a lot of time thinking, researching, learning about how local government works, both in California and across the country, and have a pretty good sense of how these structures are set up. Um, so I'm going to try and give you a very quick overview in about three to four minutes of how the different levels of government in LA uh, are meant to be set up. Uh, and any of our candidates tonight can answer some more questions about whether it actually works that way. Uh, I want to start from smallest and go all the way to big. So the smallest piece, and this is actually uh, sort of separate from your official government structures or outside elective office, is your neighborhood council. Many of you know in LA there are more than 90, there are 99 neighborhood councils. Um, these are ways in which grassroots stakeholders can hold government officials accountable. There are meetings monthly. Uh, you don't have to live in the district to be a member of your neighborhood council. You do run for it. Um, we have worked with people running for neighborhood councils in California and in LA specifically. Uh, and what they do is in part advise the, the elected officials or the broader elected government structures on how neighborhoods are feeling. Um, they're funded through the city, but they are not city government, if that makes sense. It's sort of a city funded grassroots effort. From there, you get city government. So as folks know, there's LA County and then LA City. LA City is one of 88 incorporated cities inside LA County. LA City itself is the biggest one. The single mayor, Eric Garcetti, and the 15-person city council. LA City oversees things like LAPD, the LA Fire Department, the Department of Transportation, Los Angeles Public Libraries, the LA Department of Water and Power, uh, city parks, recreation, zoning, that kind of thing. The other 87 incorporated cities might have similar structures, uh, mayor councils or council managers, which means there's a city council that then appoints a city manager or hires a city manager to actually be the person running the city day to day. Um, the thing that I think is really important here to understand is that as it relates to current conversations, the LAPD is overseen by the city government. They are, the, they are held accountable by the mayor and the city council. That budget is determined through the city council and approved by the mayor. So as you're thinking about where is the power structure to hold accountable for the city police, it's city government. Taking a step back even further, you have Los Angeles County, which is governed by a board of supervisors. There are five members of that. They oversee things like the LA County Sheriff, the LA County Assessor, the DA. Um, there's a lot of like uh, voter issues and clerks and county deeds and that kind of thing that comes from county government. They also oversee much of the services for anything that isn't in an incorporated city. So unincorporated Los Angeles, for example. Um, the LA County Sheriff, since I want to know what people are really engaged about police issues right now, the LA County Sheriff uh, provides general law enforcement services to the unincorporated parts of LA County and some of the cities who contract with the agency. And this is true for a lot of different uh, departments, but specifically with law enforcement, um, for especially for the smaller cities that don't have their in, don't have the funds necessarily or the tax base to, to fund um, these kinds of city services, they will get them from the county. Um, so again, as you're thinking about police violence and where do you, uh, who do you hold accountable for the police behavior, it's out for LAPD, it's the city of Los Angeles, for the LA Sheriff, it's the Los Angeles County. Uh, a fun fact I learned as I was learning more and more about California is that LA County is actually the largest employer in the county, the city government, the county government itself, second only to the school system. And this is an additional way of cutting up the state. Uh, there are uh, hundreds of school districts across California. There's ones for elementary and middle schools and then unified that are elementary through high school. Many of you know the LA Unified School District, which is the second largest employer in LA County. Uh, there are seven members of the LFI, LA Unified Board of Education. The LAUSD then appoints a superintendent who's the executive who actually manages the day to day. Um, the LA Unified School Unified Board of Education and comparable boards across the country are the ones deciding whether or not to open schools during the pandemic. So when we talk about why do these offices matter, it's because they are making the decisions that most directly affect our lives. Uh, and I know we're not talking about Texas tonight in any stretch of the word, but I want to point out one small note here. Um, the Texas Board of Education, which is a statewide office, but is appointed through elected through various districts, has oversight over curriculums. Uh, in the state, which is true in most school districts, but the State Board of Education has this role um, because textbooks write their text, write their curriculums for the largest market, which in this case is Texas. Um, 
at the largest like approval market, the Texas State Board of Education has line item veto power over what's in our history textbooks. There's an incredible New York Times article about this, about the difference between what textbooks in California and textbooks in Texas look like, um, which I think really illustrates, one, why these offices are so important, but two, why Republicans have spent so much time in states outside of California trying to win positions on them. Okay, so you have your neighborhood, your city, your county, you then ladder up into your state government. And you're gonna meet two candidates tonight for California State uh, Legislature. You're gonna meet uh, Godfrey, who's running for California State Assembly, which has 80 members, uh, Democrats control it, um, but it is still not as progressive as it could or should be. Um, then you'll meet Jackie, who's running for California State Senate. Uh, there are 40 members of that body. Each has more, represents more than 930,000 people. So another fun fact, if you're curious, every district in the California State Senate is bigger than the district for the Congressional House of Representatives members from California. These are incredibly, incredibly important leaders in our state and they are totally under discussed. Uh, they then work as the legislative body to the governor and to the California Supreme Court, much like we have in DC with Congress, the president um, and the Supreme Court there. That was a very, 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 very quick overview of the structure of California government. I know most of you may know this. If you don't, if you have no idea what any of that meant, I really don't want you to feel bad about asking more questions. Uh, this structure is complicated. It is true um, in states outside California. It's true in places where it's LA County and LA City overlapping in both borders and names. Um, it is meant to be hard because it's not meant for people like you and me to participate historically. It has not been something that they, they the, the political leaders, have wanted real people like us uh, to engage with. And that has changed relatively recently in the last 20, 30, 40 years. But even still, if it seems confusing or like it doesn't make sense, that's because somebody didn't want you to know how it was supposed to work. Now that we do, we have a way to make a difference in it. Um, with that, I want to introduce our first candidate for the evening who's going to talk a little bit about his story. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Godfrey last time I was in California, and he is just, he is an all-star. Um, Godfrey Santos Plata is a Filipino immigrant, a renter, an educator, and an organizer running to represent the 53rd District in the State Assembly. Uh, if he wins, he'd be the first person elected in 10 years to be both an immigrant and an out member of the LGBTQ community. Just as urgently, he'd be only the second renter to join the 80-person body, which, as we think about the conversation about affordable housing, can change the tenor of debate. Uh, he's a former public school teacher and an organizer against the school to prison pipeline. He is working to build powers for communities of color, which are the beating heart of his district in California. And I am so excited to get to hear his story again. Uh, Godfrey, take it away. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, hello, everyone uh, all over California watching this run for something Zoom. Thank you for spending your evening with us. Um, I'm also super humbled to be in the same company as Jackie and Nithya, who I admire very much. Um, I kind of want to grow up to be them. It's weird to be running at the same time um, as both of them. Um, uh, just as Amanda said, I am running for the 53rd district in the California State Assembly. For folks in LA, that's Koreatown through downtown LA, Boyle Heights, south to Huntington Park and Vernon. Um, and I, I would be the first queer immigrant ever in the 140 years of assembly history. I'm also a Filipino immigrant, um, and that's important because as, uh, we are the largest API group in California, but we've never had a person represent, our, uh, re represent us in the assembly um, in the greater LA area. So really excited to break lots of barriers. Um, a little bit about me um, uh, and how we got to our 37% of the vote in our primary that is leading us to November. Um, uh, I was born in the Philippines. Uh, my family came over here in 1988 to Los Angeles. Um, and so I've grown up here um, very much so. My, uh, my parents um, moved us into a duplex. We started out as renters. I am a renter today. Um, they worked very hard to make sure we got into the middle class. They found union jobs. Um, I went to school in LA Unified and Long Beach Unified school districts. And it was there that I really began to thrive in education because of a lot of the love um, and support around me. Uh, because of my parents, uh, because of my schooling, I was able to go to college on a full scholarship. And I decided to use that opportunity to go to college on a full scholarship to become a public school teacher and give back to my community in that way. Um, and so for the last 14 years or so, I've been in public education. Today, while I'm not in the classroom, I get to work with teachers all over the United States and help them learn how to organize because there are too many teachers and students whose voices and perspectives never influence 
education policy or community policy at all. And so I'm really excited to be able to support not just myself into um, political work, uh, but empower so many other folks uh, to do it in their own communities as well. I'm 35 going on 36 next month. And like I said, I'm here in Koreatown as a renter. If you're in LA, you already know what that means. Um, my, my rent is 40%, my monthly salary. And there's too many people who live in my same neighborhood of Koreatown and all over LA for whom it's half of our entire paychecks. I live about five blocks away from the Purple Line, which many of you all know is our, um, our, our public transportation, our train. But if I were to walk from my apartment to the Purple Line station, um, I would have to cross over multiple encampments on the way there um, in the shadows of luxury apartments that just keep building themselves up even during a pandemic while these, pan while these, uh, while these encampments grow. And then when I'm working with teachers, what I find out in every state, California notwithstanding, uh, like we are putting so much pressure on our schools to do more with less. Um, while asking our teachers to make up for everything in their classrooms when we know that the policies that we need to fix are the ones that um, are impacting our students' lives and they're bringing in their lives into the school buildings and we're asking our schools to fix it all. And this isn't fair. When you take a look at why these problems exist, you have to ask about Sacramento. And this is really hard for a lot of Angelinos to do because Sacramento is so far away. We're so much more familiar with city council and school board and mayor here in LA than we are the assembly. We knocked on over 15,000 doors and very few people actually knew what assembly was. When you take a look at the assembly and there's 80 people there legislating for the entire state of California, only three are immigrants. Only two folks have ever worked in K through 12 schools and are sitting on these education committees making education law for the entire state. And then only one currently is a renter. He's actually on his way out. So it's very possible that we will have zero renter representation in the California legislature's assembly if we do not win this seat. And housing is a giant issue in the state right now. And then when you dig in one sort of level deeper, why is it that our 80 representatives in the assembly look like this and represent some folks who we are not? Um, you have to ask about where their money is coming in from. Uh, you have to follow the money. And what we see is that the person that I'm running against, for example, is taking money from real estate developers and apartment associations that can profit from folks with higher rents here in Los Angeles and all over the state. When we talk about Black Lives Mattering, you can't ignore the fact that police unions and associations are throwing in hundreds and thousands of dollars to make sure that folks are buoyed into seats of power um, while they ravage our communities. And then when you're thinking about schools, um, when you're thinking about um, folks like ourselves who need support um, in, in education, we've got folks with corporate and business backgrounds buying their way into decision-making power and our schools begin to operate like businesses themselves, treating our kids like numbers. And that's how we get into a situation like we're in right now. Um, where not only are we in a pandemic, but we're still trying to undo the hurt of no child left behind federally. We're still trying to figure out how to get our schools back to community schools. Um, I'm working really hard to make sure that we can find ourselves in the assembly in Sacramento and find representation for ourselves. But it's really hard because um, as a grassroots candidate, um, we have to be able to raise money ourselves that battles the money that just flows into the incumbents' pockets. Um, when I talk about money flowing into their pockets, our maximum contribution is $4,700 at the state level. What that means is that that's, uh, that's more than the $2,800 one could donate to a congressional candidate, which means that we're incentivizing the biggest check writers in California to, to put people into office. While folks like ourselves who have never run for office before, we have to figure out how to make this happen if we're going to pledge allegiance to our people as opposed to corporations. And so it's people like you all who are supporting folks like myself and folks like the folks you're about to hear who are really depending on. It's not just like the money that is booing our campaign. It's also the organizing work that you all are doing, volunteering for our campaigns. Um, we can't actually just legislate out this problem of democracy's barriers with the money up there. We're gonna have to organize our way into it. We're gonna have to literally run it out. 
And Run for Something has been really powerful in helping us do that. Um, I'd appreciate your help. Um, of course, I'm going to put some links in the chat box for folks who want to find out more about our campaign. I want to make sure our other candidates get time to speak, and we're happy to answer your questions a little bit later. Thank you all so much. I could listen to you speak, Godfrey, just every night. It's like a cup of coffee. Um, it gets me so excited about what we are building together in California. So thank you for running and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, next, I want to introduce Jackie Fielder. Uh, Jackie is a candidate for the 11th District of the California State Senate. She's an Indigenous and Latina educator and organizer running for working and middle class people of San Francisco, Daly City, Colma, and South San Francisco. After graduating from Stanford with a BA in Public Policy and a Master's in Sociology, she joined her Indigenous relatives to resist the Dakota Access Pipeline and Line 3 in her, in her ancestral territories and organized internationally for indigenous rights, divestment, and climate ju justice. She went on to found the San Francisco Public Land Coalition and worked to post pass both statewide legislation and a local ordinance to create the first municipal bank in the country. Um, Jackie, I am so excited to have you here tonight and would love for you to tell us a little bit more about yourself and why you're running. You gotta make sure you unmute yourself. Let's see. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's so cool to be up here with Godfrey and Nithya, who are amazing candidates themselves. Um, and, you know, up and down the state of California, as people touched on earlier, it's just not where you would think it would be as far as progressive politics. Um, this is a state of 18 million renters. And as Godfrey said, there's only one renter in the entire state legislature. I decided to run because our particular district here in all of San Francisco, Daly City, Colma, parts of South San Francisco, is really ground zero for wealth inequality. This is where a lot of the most profitable companies in the entire world uh, call home, but it's also home to more than 9,000 homeless people. Um, this past year, I've had issues of housing insecurity myself, um, a lot of my friends and organizers that I work with are just so pressed to, to hang on for dear life here. And that's only gotten worse with the coronavirus pandemic. And I decided to run because I, I just don't think that we have any more time left. Uh, it's 2020. There should be a billionaire's tax. There should be a reignited debate and implementation of a single payer healthcare system. Um, we need you know, to expand tenant protections and protections for uh, homeless people to even exist in public. We need permanent housing, which is the only true solution to homelessness. We have for a long time been needing to cut the funding for our prisons and our police departments in favor of policies that actually provide more stability for our communities. Um, we need mental health resources. We need real living wage jobs. Um, my experience growing up in actually Southern California uh, for my upbringing, uh, raised by a single mom in a low income neighborhood near the Lakewood Long Beach border has informed a lot of my perspectives of of what is just what is a just society look like and to me in california uh it doesn't look like this one where we have 175 billionaires we have uh you know about 40 percent of the nation's unsheltered population and we have a, a public education system where we uh invest in per student spending among the bottom in the nation where we are actually rivaling, uh, rivaling Florida and Louisiana for having the highest poverty rate in the nation. And these are also compounded by factors of race and obviously immigration status. And so my heart just broke last year seeing my district um, continue to, you know, allow wealth to be concentrated at, at the top and leave so many people behind. And it's, it's coming for, for everyone. I'm an educator at San Francisco State. We also in San Francisco have uh, more than 1,800 homeless San Francisco Unified uh, students. 1,800? How can we say that casually? And so my, my interest in really uh, understanding the flows of money came from my involvement in the No Dakota Access Pipeline movement, where I was fresh out of college. 
I was looking on my social media timelines and I was seeing videos of my relatives uh, facing down the barrel of guns, all because they wanted to protect our sacred sites, our treaty territories from this pipeline company that wanted to put uh, a pipeline to pump hundreds of thousands of gallons of oil uh, every single day. And so I saw that, I went to Standing Rock. After that, it was just so clear to me how far this country was going to go to protect profits and sacrifice people. And that, that's not exclusive to the fossil fuel industry. It happens in housing, where we are commodifying the basic human necessity of shelter. It happens in healthcare, where we're commodifying the basic human necessity of medicine and, and, and well-being. Uh, it's happening in pretty much every sector of our lives, where, where we're getting to a point where it's costing money just to wake up, where uh, the American dream and equal opportunity is just something you have to inherit. And I don't think that that's the world that we, we can accept any longer. And we can't wait for, for any more um, the right people. We can't wait for people to develop a consciousness. And for certainly, we have to get money out of politics. And so that's why I'm not taking any contributions from uh, the real estate lobby, fossil fuel companies, charter school advocates. It's simply my way of being able to tell people and look them in the eye and say, I will fight for you and you because you are my constituent. Um, and I wish that that could be the case for every single politician in the California legislature, but it's not. Um, and I think that now is the time to make that happen. Um, so thank you, Run for Something, for putting this together, and I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, your story is so inspiring, and I'm so excited uh, that you are running and waging such a competitive campaign. Um, our last speaker for this evening, before we open it up for questions, uh, is Nithya Rahman. Nithya is an urban planner, a community leader, and a mother of two running for Los Angeles City Council in District 4. Uh, in response to a growing population of people experiencing homelessness in her community, Nithya and a group of her neighbors started Salah Neighborhood, Neighborhood Homeless Coalition in 2017. This past year, she served as executive director of Time's Up Entertainment, the women's rights movement furthering equity and safety for women in the entertainment industry. Uh, I am really excited to hear more about her campaign, her story, and why she's running. Uh, and then we will bring all of our candidates back up to answer your questions. So, Nithya, take it away. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hi, thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm really excited also to be uh, in the company of Godfrey and Jackie, both of whom I've um, had the opportunity to meet. Um, and talk with and learn from. So I'm very, very happy to be here. I also noticed that um, some of the people in the comments are folks I recognize from my time at Time's Up because it looks like there's some folks from the entertainment industry here. Um, as Amanda said, um, I'm a mother of twin preschoolers. I live in the Silver Lake neighborhood. I'm an urban planner by training. Um, and I've spent most of my career working on issues related to urban poverty. I spent a number of years in India working with people who lived in slums and informal settlements there who were fighting for things like land rights, toilets, running water, really the basics. Um, and in Los Angeles, um, I've done almost all of my work except for my time at Time's Up on homelessness. First at City Hall in 2014, where I wrote a report assessing the city's response to homelessness then, and later as a community leader who founded SELA, which Amanda mentioned, um, which is now one of the most active volunteer run homeless coalitions in the city. I wanted to tell you today about why I decided to run for this seat because um, becoming a politician was never in the cards for me. Um, I essentially got fed up. I had worked on the issue of homelessness for many years and I had grown increasingly frustrated at the city's response. So this year, um, for those of you who don't keep as close a watch on the numbers as I do, in LA, our homeless population rose again by a double digit percentage point increase. So 14% increase this year to 41,000 people uh, homeless in LA. This is a 78% increase since this mayor has come into power, which is just a staggering, staggering number. And this has really been thanks to a housing crisis that has played out and has had its most severe impacts 
on lower income communities and communities of color. Um, and I want to share one fact, which always, I think, um, uh, really brings this home to me. Over the last two decades in Los Angeles, we've lost our black population to our affordable housing crisis. So our black population in Los Angeles has dropped by 20% over the last um, 20 years. Uh, and while our black population in LA makes up uh, only 8% of our total population, they make up almost a third of our unhoused neighbors. So this is really, you can see the differential impacts that our housing crisis has had across our city. What I saw in my work over and over again on homelessness was a system that was created by our elected officials, which left a massive, massive gap in services. We have in LA less than a quarter of the shelter beds that we need for our unhoused population. We have 9,000 people sleeping in their cars and 250 legal parking spots for them. Till 2018, so that was just two years ago, despite decades of homelessness here in LA, we had almost no outreach workers. These are the people who are tasked with getting people off of the streets to helping people across a very long process to get housed. Um, there were, when I did my work at City Hall in 2014, there were 19 outreach workers, not just for the city, but for the city and county together. Let that sink in for a moment. This is compared to, let's say, our LAPD uh, force, which is at, stands at 10,000 today. So you can see the difference in investment and in priorities for the city. In most parts of the city today, there continues to be no showers, no bathrooms, no case managers, no walk-in shelter beds. In fact, we have chosen to create a system here in Los Angeles where once you are homeless, we have made it almost impossible for you to get off of the streets. And this system that we have chosen to create has had devastating consequences. Last year, a thousand people died on the streets of Los Angeles. That's three a day, more than three a day. And we've also created a system where the most frequent points of contact between those experiencing homelessness and the government is LAPD. And one out of three uses of force by the LAPD were actually against people experiencing homelessness. So this is a system that has created vulnerability, not just to the elements, but to our police. I decided to run because I got fed up. Um, I was fed up with a Grand Canyon sized gap between the rhetoric that I heard from our elected officials around urgency, around compassion, and the reality that I saw on the ground when I was working as uh, someone trying to access homeless services for people in my neighborhood, or as I watched residents experiencing homelessness try to navigate an incredibly brutal system. And as an urban planner, as a longtime observer of this city, um, and as Amanda said, looking at how much the city controls, city council members here, I knew, are uniquely powerful. We have a weak mayor, strong council system. We only have 15 council members. Each council district, so you said uh, Senate, state Senate districts are big. City council districts in LA have 250,000 people in each of them. That's enormous. And over all of the issues that the city controls, I saw a similar lack of urgency, a similar gap between the sometimes very progressive rhetoric that I heard and the reality of what I saw, whether it was related to our housing crisis, whether it was related to our environmental issues, all of those issues that I know everyone in this space holds dearest to their hearts. We ran um, a very good campaign in the primary, a campaign that I think any progressive would be very proud of. We recruited over 600 unique volunteers who helped us knock on 83,000 doors. That's more than any city council candidate we've ever heard in LA. Um, lifted by people power, truly. We made it through to the runoff against an incumbent that's only happened twice in the last two decades here. Um, and we did that against an incumbent who raised and spent a record-breaking amount of money as well. And these past few months, this isn't really the general election campaign that I thought I would be running. Um, we've been running this campaign in the context of a devastating global pandemic. Uh, where we've seen a historic uprising on the streets to protest police brutality. We have, in response to these unprecedented events, seen movement in the policies coming out of City Hall. We have seen that. But to be honest, um, I'm still pretty fed up. <laughs> uh, to me, uh, it should not take a global pandemic to put eviction protections in place 
to create a rent freeze in RSO units, these are rent stabilized units, in a city that has had tens of thousands of evictions, in a city that is defined by homelessness. Why did we have to let people suffer for so long before we took action here in LA? Why does it take hundreds of thousands of people taking to the streets for weeks before we have the courage to even talk about the bloated LAPD budget? I want transformative change for this city. I want people in power who don't wait until it's politically safe to pick the next move. Um, I want people who will do the work to push us towards an LA that is sustainable, that is just, that's good for all of us. And I know that this group shares that urgency and shares that, um, those values. So I'm very happy to be here um, and to answer uh, all your questions. So thank you so much. Thank you. And oh my God, that fact about 19 people doing homeless outreach versus the LAPD officers, that is, wild so thank you for really telling that story through with the numbers um as jackie comes back on we're going to open it up to questions if you have any questions for any of our candidates uh please drop them in the q a um first one and i know you all touched on this a little bit and this is a question from ac um, about how we can fix our homelessness crisis um thinking about it from the level or the office that you're running for what is the what's your approach going to be assuming you win um we'll start with godfrey and then go back around in the order of speaking yeah, what I actually really love about this panel is um, I, you, you, can't fix, uh, you can't fix homelessness from a single level of office. That's, that's just like not going to work. You have to actually create like the, the chain effect across the entire state and, and down on the local level. Um, for me, I think the biggest role we can play aside from funding clearly, um, which the state has been thinking about, the greatest role we can play is moving in a direction where we're decommodifying housing in general. Um, lots of us like to say that housing is a human right. Um, that can't be true if I have to pay for housing um, or pay for rent um, and, and uh, be complicit in a system in which if some people can't afford to pay rent, then they're not going to get housing. That's how this number that Nithya brought up, um, we're at 66,000 now, last year we're at 58,000. That's how that number keeps going up. Homelessness doesn't create itself. We create that problem for ourselves by being complicit in this particular problem. For me, um, for me, where that starts is if we're protecting renters right now, that means we need um, a tenant's right to counsel. Uh, we need to stop, uh, we need to repeal the Ellis Act, which continues to allow owners of buildings like the one that I live in, my 19 unit here in Koreatown, to sell buildings like this uh, to speculative real estate developers, pushing up the prices in the neighborhoods that we live in, um, kicking people out of Los Angeles in general at any age um, of any documentation status. Um, that means we need to think about rent registries. Um, which would allow us to actually keep track of rent prices in our neighborhoods and communities so that we see where these problems are happening and hold folks accountable to the fact that these prices just keep going up and up. Um, Jackie's um, opponent um, advocated for density, um, but without actually um, increasing the percentage of affordable housing um, that, that is necessary for any sort of development um, in this state. Um, a tenth of affordable housing in a new development is not going to cut it when, we're, when we have 1.5 million units of affordable housing that we actually need um, in California. Um, and so we need to prioritize that, move toward cl much closer to 100% affordable housing um, if we're going to fix the problem of, of, of uh, homelessness to begin with. Jackie? Godfrey touched on a lot of points that I would make uh, support, you know, also the idea that we we don't have the resources to house the the thousands of homeless people in our state because we certainly do this is the fifth largest economy in the world again 175 billionaires there's just there's not enough lifetimes to spend that amount of wealth and we're facing a wave of evictions right now today because our state legislature not a single one has put forward um, even an option for true rent relief that doesn't have uh, burdensome requirements and barriers uh, that's not voluntary. The current one that's on the table looks like a renter debt scheme where the state assumes a renter's debt and then it could be traded on the secondary markets. Uh, and on top of all of that, it's voluntary. Uh, landlords could say, oh, well, look, they, they agreed to it. You know, they could perhaps pressure them to sign something and a tenant doesn't know um, and then say, look, they signed away this this option. 
Um, there are a lot of flaws with that option right now, and it's really the only one that's being considered. And so, because we probably have, you know, one renter in the entire legislature uh, versus the population having 18 of 40 million renters, um, it's just really sad. And, you know, evictions are just an, the step right before homelessness. At the same time, um, there's a lot of energy and excitement around navigation centers, but if we don't have housing, permanent housing and supportive services to navigate people to, then those centers don't really serve the purpose that they're meant to. And so the only cure to, to homelessness is housing. Um, that said, we need to, to fall, also fund services like mental health, substance abuse and everything else. But we also have to understand homelessness looks uh, not in, in many of the ways that we think of and is out there in the culture. Um, again, we need to protect tenants. We need to secure affordable housing. That's why I'm championing a California Housing Emergency Fund of $10 billion. Um, and we need to house the poor. Great, can you guys hear me? <laughs> um, yeah, so I actually did, I wanna, since um, Godfrey and Jackie talked a lot about the supply of uh, housing, um, why don't I focus on what, uh, you know, what I really think the city can reshape quickly, which is how services are delivered to people experiencing homelessness. So from the perspective of someone who has accompanied, uh, tried to access services for people um, near me, um, who has dealt with the system, uh, I think that we could do a lot more to transform that system to make it one that people are actually able to use to climb out of homelessness quickly, effectively, safely. Uh, right now, a study found that um, from the city found that over two thirds of connections being made, now there's more outreach workers than 19, um, but two thirds of the connections being made between those outreach workers and people experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles happens in the context of sweeps. So these are, you know, where cleanups, where people's things are picked up and thrown out and people are forced to move from one area to maybe to another. Um, and they're offered services at that moment. And if they say no, which people often do because there's often police, it's a very scary time. It's a time when they're, they're trying to save their possessions and, their, um, and what's valuable to them. They're labeled as service resistant. Uh, I think that service resistance is a fallacy for the most part, um, and that we just haven't created a system where people are really able to accept services effectively and to be able to use those services to get off the streets. Uh, so I've talked about, instead of doing what we're doing now, to build a network of community access centers, all of which are staffed by outreach workers and mental health caseworkers who know every individual in their neighborhood who's experiencing homelessness by name and who are tasked with building up relationships of trust with them and accompanying them on what is often a very labyrinthine process of getting into housing. Um, and I know that there is a shortage of housing, but I will say that even the housing that exists right now, often it lies empty for weeks, for months, because people aren't ready to step into that housing. I've heard that over and over again. In fact, Lhasa has access to thousands of units which are lying empty right now because they don't have people ready to go into that housing. And the reason is that we've set up a service provision system which does not work. And I think that is something that is fully within, it's not fully within the city's control, but it is within the city's control to transform that system and to make it into one that is undergirded by compassion and accountability for everyone involved um, and would ideally remove LAPD from being the first, first and most frequent point of contact between the government and those experiencing homelessness. Thank you guys for those really thoughtful and detailed answers. I think it's really helpful to be able to understand the power that these offices actually have to move the needle um, on this really critical issue. Um, I want to change gears a little bit. We've had a couple questions come in from both Shay and Nick um, about, and as well as someone anonymous, about uh, how your campaigns are functioning right now. Um, 
Shay wanted to know, Nithya, what you learned from the primary and how you're thinking about going into November. Um, Nick, similarly a future constituent, he hopes, uh, about effective actions they can do to help you win. Um, but I would love for Nithya, Godfrey, and then Jackie to talk a little bit about what your campaign actually looks like right now and how you're reaching voters, especially during the pandemic. Um, and how folks can help you outside of donating, which I know everyone on this call will. <laughs> Nithya, can you take this first? Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. Um, we have a pretty large volunteer operation in place um, already that we encourage people to get uh, involved with um, if they're interested in getting involved with something beyond just donations. So as I said, in the primary, we had one of the largest volunteer operations uh, in the city. Uh, and we continue, we've actually had more volunteers sign up in the, um, in the general than we had at the very end of our contest in the primary. So we've had just an enormous amount of interest um, in our election and in, I think, in local politics in general. Both the pandemic and the uprising has enabled large numbers of people to make connections between local government and the values that they hold and the, the, the injustice that they see around them. And that's been, that's been good. Um, so if people want to get involved with our campaign, they can sign up. We'll onboard you in a volunteer onboarding uh, meeting, and then we'll send you out to do four different kinds of things. Um, you'll be text banking, phone banking, writing postcards, and doing uh, all kinds of relational organizing. So that will be organizing meetings in your own neighborhood and with people you know in the district, um, or if you don't know a lot of people in the district, but you do live in the district, we'll give you a way to contact your neighbors safely. Everything is done with COVID precautions in mind. Um, but essentially, you'll be able to rally people around you and rally your network to get votes um, for November. Godfrey? I feel like this is really great because we need to have this conversation amongst progressive candidates to figure, there's no playbook for a pandemic election. And so we're, we're kind of just all, all building this plane as, as we're flying it. Um, to Nithya's point about depending on volunteers and people power, that's true for our campaign as well. I'm putting in um, into the chat box, this is how you can get, get into our Slack. And if you join our Slack, um, that's where you can meet other volunteers, uh, filter into some of the committees that we have running. Um, in addition to some of the things that Nithya talked about, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, it, it just felt really awkward to me to do anything that remotely looked like campaigning. So we repurposed our phone banking system to do community check-ins um, and just really call folks, especially in the um, older age brackets um, that live within our district to, um, to make calls and literally ask, how are you? What do you need um, at this time? It was, felt like a way we could leverage what we had to show up. Um, we, like this, we, we've pivoted to virtual programming and events. Um, the demographic I really want to ignite into democracy is not necessarily the folks who are already plugged into the Democratic Party, et cetera, and all of that right now. And so we've had a lot of fun virtual events that have operated as fundraisers as well. No one wants to come on at Zoom late at night and just talk about policy. Maybe, maybe we do, but lots of other people like want to play bingo, go to a talent show. We're having a Loteria night next week um, that's going to be bilingual. So um, folks can just literally play games in community and hear about a campaign that wants to represent them at the same time. And that's how we're beginning to pivot on this. So those are just a couple of other things I'd add to what Nithya said. Uh, thank you. I'll also put a volunteer link. Um, you know, like everyone else, we've just been chugging along, doing phone banks virtually in our Zoom rooms. Um, you know, been so amazed by the, the influx of volunteers uh, now that actually people have more time to dedicate, ironically. Um, so we're, we're calling people all the time. Um, every single day we have a phone bank training and shift around 4 p.m. And so you're welcome to sign up for that. Um, we're also doing what we call literature drops, lit drops, where you have your brochure. And this is a district of, you know, 500,000 people are expected to vote in the general. So we have to hit uh, the entire district like crazy. And 
so we're, we're passing out these flyers in people's doors. Often people think that they are mail. They're not. We hand deliver them because mail is extremely expensive. And so we do that, um, you know, pretty much every day now, just starting up again, uh, safely delivered with masks and gloves and hand sanitizer and all of that. So those are our volunteering opportunities. Obviously, social media ironically goes a long way. I can't tell you how many people have learned about the campaign, have volunteered as a phone maker just by hearing about us on social media. So that helps too. Um, that's amazing. And I know we'll keep dropping links to all of your websites and information uh, in the chat and in an email to everyone who's on this, who will get, you'll get it tomorrow in your inbox. Um, we have so many good questions and I wanna get to one more uh, before we close it out. Um, and so for each of you, uh, Nithya, can you talk, Deanna Fuller wants to know a little bit about the city budget. Is it created annually? How does the mayor work? Uh, or how does the mayor pay a part in this? And then Godfrey and Jackie, um, AC wanted to know, how do we create urgency at the state level to apportion money to communities of color and social services? And what does that look like? Um, so we'll start with Nithya talking about the city budget and then Godfrey and Jackie on uh, reallocating money at the state level. Yeah, so the uh, LA city budget is actually put together by the mayor every year. And then the council has a month long period through which they can approve it, um, disapprove it, make any necessary amendments. That period is over already. Um, and uh, that was uh, before, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk then about looking at how much of the budget had gone to LAPD over 54%, uh, over 50%, 54% of our discretionary budget had gone to LAPD. And a number of groups um, assembled under a coalition called the People's Budget had drawn attention to it. This was even before um, the protests happened. Uh, and it was kind of shocking that um, police budgets increased at a time when services budgets, uh, services dollars were actually going down during a pandemic when both crime was down and service needs are so high. Um, but this was, this was like the first time that I've seen widespread attention being paid to the budgeting process here in Los Angeles. Uh, and thanks to the work of the uh, People's Budget, which has been uh, anchored by, the, uh, by Black Lives Matter LA. Um, Jackie, why don't you start about uh, apportioning more money on the state level to communities of color? Yeah, I mean, it's been something that we've been needing to do for a long time. Um, you know, the budget at this point looks like cutting a lot of the public school funding, which is unfortunate. Um, and the state Senate had to fight the governor to basically preserve funding for higher education as well, which is still on the chopping block. And, you know, relative to our prison budget, our prison budget is as much as our higher education budget. Um, you know, a budget is, is a statement of our values as we know now, but that's not, what, that's not what our budget in California shows. And so we need to expand the budget, again, asking the wealthiest individuals and corporations to pay their fair share while also um, divesting from our prison budget and reinvesting in basic human needs that will disproportionately benefit communities of color, like single payer healthcare, public schools, uh, you name it. Ditto a lot of what Jackie said. What's really interesting is that um, the, the question is about like uh, proportioning the, uh, up proportioning money to communities of color and right now there's funding up there it's just oppressing communities of color like it's there like the money's budgeted to hold open um state prisons etc the money's there to um continue to to pay for um to pay for the right of um health providers um to be able to um uh, not have to state what they are um, providing services for in hospitals that are um, faith-based for example is is a thing that's happening at the state level. Um, there's like laws that allow um, allow um, people to not actually get what they need from um, from from uh, health systems or from rehabilitation, et cetera, because they're budgeted somewhere else. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll put into the chat box. Literally, you everyone can take a look at the corrections budget um, right now, so you can see how much money we're 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 putting toward that. Um, thank you guys for those really helpful answers. I know we had some more questions we weren't able to get to, but in, for the sake of ending right on time, I want to say thank you to Nithya, to Godfrey, to Jackie for joining us tonight. Um, again, thank you to our hosts, uh, Rafi and Nikita. 
um, Ali and uh, Abe, it is so, so, so important to understand how local government works. Um, if you care about ICE coming into schools, if you care about choice, if you care about police brutality or ending police brutality, if you care about how we're dealing with the coronavirus pandemic, you have to care about local government. You have to care about state legislatures, uh, both in your home, in California, in LA, but nationally, you have to give a shit about these offices because I promise you, especially outside of California, Republicans really care. Uh, and what happens, what gets normalized in crazy conservative cities nationwide bubbles up on the national level. So even in the great nation of California, you will feel the effect of the crazy Republicans in South Carolina and Florida and Georgia as their decisions then bubble up to the Supreme Court and fuck us all over. So if you are excited about the candidates you saw tonight, um, tomorrow in your inbox, you will get links to all of their websites so that you can contribute to them and sign up to volunteer. You will also get a link to give to run for something. Uh, our budget gap got blown to smithereens at, because of the coronavirus pandemic. We were supposed to travel and do a bunch of events. Instead, we're doing this. Um, and every single dollar goes to recruiting and supporting more people like Nithya, like Godfrey, like Jackie. Um, so we dropped the link in the chat, runforsomething.net slash build. Uh, whatever you're able to do, I know you've all been so generous already, but it really does mean a lot to our very scrappy organization. Um, with that, if you have any other questions, uh, we're all available online, on social. Uh, you'll get um, URLs in your inbox tomorrow. Um, thank you so much, and have a really good rest of your night, everybody.